Hello and welcome to Unity Presbyterian Church Online. This week in worship, Pastor Dana takes a look at the symbol of baptism. Let's listen. This week we are diving deeper into the symbols of our faith and the symbol that we will be studying this week is the sacrament of baptism. And specifically, we'll be looking more closely at why we baptize in the Christian faith and then what happens to us through that baptismal process. And I think that the best place for us to start as we study this is to look at Jesus's baptism. And so we know in scripture that Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist. And so let's turn to that gospel and take a closer look. We find it in Matthew chapter 3, verses 13 through 17. It says, Then Jesus went from Galilee to the Jordan River to be baptized by John. But John tried to talk him out of it. I am the one who needs to be baptized by you. He said, Why are you coming to me? But Jesus said, It should be done, for we must carry out all that God requires. So John agreed to baptize him. After his baptism, as Jesus came up out of the water, the heavens were opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and settling on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, who brings me great joy. So in this passage, we are told that Jesus is baptized by his cousin, John the Baptist. And what is interesting in this story is that we learn that Jesus is much older in life when he is baptized. No one knows the exact age that Jesus was when he was baptized. And there exists a lot of uh, Bible scholar debate around this topic. Over the years, Bible scholars have inferred that Jesus was on or around age 30 when he was baptized. One Bible scholar noted, In the Jewish tradition, the age of 30 held particular significance, as it marked the point at which a person could enter into the priesthood or assume a position of public ministry. This cultural context has further bolstered the argument that Jesus was likely around 30 years old when he received baptism aligning with the commencement of his public ministry. In the first century in Judea, the practice of ritual immersion or baptism was not uncommon among Jewish communities. It was oftentimes associated with purification and repentance, symbolizing the cleansing of impurities and the readiness to lead a renewed life accordingly to God's will. John the Baptist was a prominent figure throughout the Gospels, and he was a huge proponent of baptism. So it's against this backdrop that Jesus' baptism served as a definitive declaration of his identity and mission, setting him apart as the long-awaited Messiah and inaugurating his role as the Savior of all humanity. Now, we have evolved a long ways since ancient biblical times. Nowadays, in the Presbyterian denomination, we do things a little bit differently. Here in the Presbyterian faith, we believe that a person can be baptized well before the age 30. In fact, we think that you can baptize a child at infancy. And the the theology behind this practice of infant baptism— It signifies our belief that God is present in our lives well before we are even aware of it. God is present from the very beginning. Infant baptism signifies our awareness of how God is already active and at work in our hearts and in our minds before our brains are even capable of comprehending it. Our practice of infant baptism, it represents our belief and our awareness of how there is nothing we can do to earn God's love and grace in much the same way that a child does not earn the love and grace of their parents, but yet it is freely bestowed upon them. Such is the case with God. God freely bestows his love and grace upon each of us from the very beginning, from the very first breath we take. Now, since the Presbyterian way of doing things entails baptizing children at infancy, 
then that means that those who have grown up in this faith probably don't remember their baptism. You may see pictures, you may see videos, you may hear stories about your baptism, but you cannot recall it firsthand. And I know that some of you are cradle Presbyterians. You have been in this church from the very beginning when you were just a wee little thing sleeping in a cradle. And so you weren't able to recall that very significant moment in your life. Now, some of you may have grown up in a different faith tradition. Maybe you grew up in the Baptist church, and so you were baptized at a much older age, and you can remember that sacrament. I did not grow up in the Presbyterian church. I grew up in the Baptist church. And as a little 10-year-old, I attended this Baptist church that was not too far from my home. And I was baptized in that church. And so I remember when on the day of my baptism, I wore all white, just like my pastor instructed me to do so. I was supposed to wear all white. And so I go and sit in the pew right where he told me to sit. And when we get to that point where he's going to baptize me, he calls me forward. And so I get up from the pew and I'm walking down in front of everybody. And I come up on the chancel and there's a big, huge tub of water. There is a huge tub of water that has glass, clear glass on all four sides. So you can see that it's official. I'm going to get dunked. Okay. That baptism is occurring. And so I step into the tub, just like he instructed. He puts one hand over my nose so he can hold my nose for me. And then he puts one hand behind my back so that he can help support me down and up. And so each time he dunks me, he says, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then I come back up and the crowd goes wild. Everybody's smiling. They're clapping. And so they're cheering and I'm smiling. I'm so excited. And then they lead me off the chance. So they lead me to a back room where I change into some dry clothes and I'm blow drying my hair. And I remember standing back there and I'm in front of the mirror doing my hair and I'm inspecting myself. And I look closer and closer and I notice that there's no changes in my outer appearance. I still have freckles. I still have my straight hair. I really wanted curly hair. And so I march out of this room and I go straight over to my mom and I say, mom, they did not do this correctly. I still look exactly the same. And so she snickered. She laughed just like you all. And then she reassured me that my baptism had in fact gone exactly like it was supposed to. She told me that it wasn't supposed to change my outer appearance, but rather it was more about the changes that were occurring within the changes that would occur with my relationship with God. She told me that it was much more about how my baptism would change and affect my heart. But for months and months and months, I was absolutely convinced that my pastor did not baptize me correctly. And it wasn't until many years later that I started to realize and really understand what my mom meant when she told me what my baptism was supposed to do and what it signified. As the years press on, I didn't experience these outward changes. There weren't changes in my physical appearance like I had hoped and anticipated as a little 10-year-old, but there were changes that occurred within, some pretty pivotal changes that occurred with my inner identity, how I perceived myself, how I perceived this world. In the years following my baptism, I came to understand myself more and more as a child of God. And as a child of God, I knew that God loved me. I knew that God was always watching over me and protecting me. I knew that God had a plan and purpose for my life, all of which made me a stronger and more confident young woman. And that is what our baptism is supposed to do. It is supposed to change and affect our inner identity, how we perceive ourselves. It should give us direction in life, the strengths that we need to persevere in the face of difficulties. It should instill this silent inner confidence that can never be shaken because it can never be taken from us. And our baptism should also change and affect how we relate to this world how we live and relate with other people in this world. 
Henry Nguyen, he was a great writer and theologian, and he once said, God loved you before you were born, and God will love you after you die. In scripture, God says, I have loved you with an everlasting love. This is a very fundamental truth of your identity. This is who you are, whether you feel it or not. You belong to God from eternity to eternity. Life is a little opportunity for you during a few years to say, I love you too. Baptism changes and affects who we are inside. It doesn't change our physical appearance, it doesn't, but it does change us spiritually. And it changes us emotionally as we grow in our faith. Baptism changes and affects who we understand ourselves to be and then how we will relate to others. The years following our baptism is a time for us to say to God, I love you more than words can express. It's a time for us to put that love for God into action. St. Augustine once described the sacrament of baptism as an outward and visible sign of an inward an invisible grace. And that sounds like a very simple one-sentence answer, but it points to the complexity of the Christian journey, where after your point of baptism, we spend our entire lives journeying closer and closer to God. We spend our entire lives working to build up the kingdom of God here on earth. St. Augustine's description of baptism, it points to this inner awakening that we experience at the point of our baptism, the grace that we receive, which then compels us throughout our entire life to follow in Christ's footsteps. St. Augustine's description, it points to how our baptism initiates this inner awakening that continually nudges us throughout our lives to live as Christ did at all costs. There was another brilliant theologian who studied the sacrament of baptism, Diedrich Bonhoeffer. He was a German theologian, and he wrote a book on this topic. The name of the book is called The Cost of Discipleship. One of the most widely quoted parts of that book discusses the distinction that Bonhoeffer makes between cheap grace and costly grace. Bonhoeffer says cheap grace is the preaching of forgiveness without requiring repentance, or baptism without church discipline, or having communion without confession. According to Bonhoeffer, cheap grace is grace without discipleship, grace without the cross, grace without Jesus Christ. Cheap grace, Bonhoeffer says, is to hear the gospel preached as follows. Of course you have sinned, but now everything is forgiven. So you can stay just as you are and enjoy the consolations of forgiveness. Bonhoeffer says the main defect with that proclamation is that it contains no demand for discipleship. In contrast to cheap grace, costly grace confronts us with a gracious call to follow after Jesus. A gracious call, not a forceful, punitive call, but grace that compels us. It is costly because it compels a man to submit to the yoke of Christ and to follow after him. Baptism changes and affects our lives in ways that we cannot necessarily see, and we don't see those effects immediately. But over the years, as we grow in our faith, it changes the way that we see ourselves. It changes the way we see this world, and it most certainly changes the way that we live thereafter. I heard a story recently about a gentleman who had just started attending church. He was a 65-year-old man, and he had just started going to church. And so when he started coming to this little church, he sought out the pastor, and he asked the pastor two questions. He said, what do I have to do to be baptized, and what happens to me after I'm baptized? And so he and the pastor had a very lengthy conversation, and a couple months later, this 65-year-old man was baptized. So the pastor stands over the font and he anoints him with the water and baptizes him. Afterwards, this gentleman shared how moving of an experience that was for him. He had just retired as a counselor. He had spent his entire life trying to help people find wholeness, find peace, 
to fill the voids within, but yet he himself had never felt that sense of wholeness. He had never felt that sense of wholeness until he was baptized. And then after he was baptized, the way he spent the rest of his life changed. He started working for a food pantry. And on Christmas days, he would go and work at a health clinic. He would prepare food for those who needed a meal on Christmas morning. He would go and sit with those who didn't have family, those who didn't have a home or gifts to open that day. And he helped them to feel loved and seen. At the point of our baptism, there is an inner awakening that occurs. There is a shift, a divine stirring that compels us to follow in Christ's footsteps at all costs, meaning that we make sacrifices in our lives because of our love for God, because of our desire to further God's kingdom in this world. There are certain times in our lives when we may feel more compelled to follow in Christ's footsteps, more compelled to live as Christ did and at other points in our lives. And that is just part of the Christian journey. There is a waxing and there is a waning. But nevertheless, there is always an inward grace at work within each of us, a divine stirring that nudges us and shapes us into Christ's disciples. And as I look out at this congregation, I see that divine stirring at work. I see the effects of your baptismal vows at play. I am constantly amazed at the time and energy that you all pour into this church. I'm amazed at your commitment that brings you here every Sunday, every Wednesday night, and for Bible studies on Tuesdays sometimes. I'm amazed at how you use your gifts and your resources, how you donate goods for others in our community who are in need, how you give monetary gifts to this church. That is because of the divine stirring within That is solely because of your love for God and your commitment to furthering Christ's ministry in this community, to sharing Christ's love and grace with others in this world. The sacrament of baptism, it may not have this outward effect on us. We may not look differently when we pass through those waters, but the way that we look at ourselves and the lens that we have for this world will change. There is an inward grace at work within each of us that compels us to live and act differently. This morning during our 930 service, we had the opportunity to baptize a little baby. We baptized Emerson Virginia Mullis. This is the daughter of Caitlin and Travis Mullis, granddaughter of Philip and Martha Minter. And now I know that those of you who attend our 11 o'clock service always miss out on that baptism. And I know that it's a little dig. And so we recorded the service for you this morning. And so let us take a look. Confident of those promises, we baptize those whom God has called. And today we joyfully welcome yet another line of God's most precious children. And baptism that claims us and seals us to show that we belong to him. It frees us from sin and death, and it unites us with Jesus Christ in his ministry of love and peace. By water and by the Holy Spirit, we are being members of the church, the body of Christ. And so this morning, let us all remember our own baptism as we celebrate in this sacrament. On behalf of the session, it is an honor to present to you Emerson, Virginia, Wallace, for the sacrament of baptism. In presenting your child for baptism, you announce your faith in Jesus Christ and show that you want your child to study him, to know him, and to obey him and serve him as his chosen disciple. And so now I have a series of questions for each of you as you make this public proclamation. Is Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior? Do you trust in him? Do you intend your child to be his disciple, to obey his word and show his love? And to all of you, members of this church, Unity Presbyterian Church and the Church Universal, do you promise to guide and nurture Emerson by word and deed, with love as prayer, 
encouraging her to know and follow Christ and to be a faithful member of this church. If so, please say it, we do. Let us pray. God, our Father, we thank you for your faithfulness promised in this sacrament, for the hope that we have in your Son, Jesus Christ. As we baptize with water, baptize us with the Holy Spirit, so that what we see may be your word, and what we do may be your work. By your power, may we be made one with Christ our Lord in common faith and purpose. In Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. This morning, I'd like to point out that the water that we'll be using is the same water that comes from a stream that was behind the wedding venue where Travis and Kate led sealed their covenants with one another and with God, where they took their vows of holy matrimony. It's the same stream that runs down the, the road a few more miles past Caitlin's parents' house, the house that she grew up in, the yard that she played in. And so it is very significant and a beautiful um, water that we could now baptize in sin with and seal our covenant with God. Emerson and I, her buddies, <laughs> Emerson and Virginia Mullis, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. From then. Let us our hang prayer. Gracious and loving God, we are forever grateful for the ways that you call us and the ways that you claim us. For the ways that you love us and watch over us and provide for us in all ways. And God, what a joy it is to now have Emerson be joining the royal family. For we ask that you will watch over her all the days of her life. That you will keep her close to you. That you will speak to her in the silent whispers that you speak with. God, give her and help her to know her purpose and meaning in life. And God, be with Caitlin and Travis as they continue to... Help her to grow in the faith, guide and guide your word, and continue to provide for each of them. Amen. It was a wonderful time of celebration this morning, and just a beautiful witness to see another baby be brought into the family. And during that baptism, you heard me ask Caitlin and Travis to affirm Emerson's baptismal vows. You heard me ask them questions like, do you profess Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior? Do you trust in him? Will you be Christ's faithful disciple, obeying his word and showing his love? This morning, as we continue to explore the sacrament of baptism, this ancient symbol of our faith, I invite you to reflect on these vows, the vows that were taken at the point of your baptism. I invite you to reflect on where your baptismal journey has led you present day, reflecting on those times when you have followed in Christ's footsteps at certain points, or maybe where you have veered off the path. And may this be a time of renewal, perhaps a time of reaffirmation, a recommitment to God. May it be a time where you are awakened to that inward grace within, that divine stirring, May it be a time where we awaken to that inner nudge that compels us to follow in Christ's footsteps at all costs. Amen. If you would like more information about Unity Presbyterian Church, please visit our website at www.unitypres.org or visit us on Facebook. This is the Unity Presbyterian Church Podcast. Have a great week.